Okay, so good afternoon, my colleagues. Okay, it's my honor, and it's nice to see you this afternoon. It's an honor to present you today's speaker, Professor David J. Slavitz. Professor, in the following four weeks, okay, Professor Slavitz is going to give us a lecture series on green boundary science engineering. Today is the first lecture on green boundary structure and dynamics. Before we start, let me give you a brief introduction to Professor. Slovitz. Uh, Professor Slovitz did his PhD in material science at the University of Pennsylvania and a postdoc at Exxon Corporate Research Laboratory, followed by a staff position on the theory division, theory division of Los Alamos National Laboratory. He rejoined us in 2018. He was professors in a few world renowned universities. This includes the University of Pennsylvania, University and uh, Princeton University and the Yeshua University, and uh, you know, and also he was also the, the executive director of the Institute of High Performance Computing at Singapore, and served variously as department chair and dean. Okay, so let's give a big hand to Professor Srovitz. <laughs> so, uh, let me just begin by thanking all of you for coming. Um, Today and the next few lectures, what I'm going to be trying to do is give an overview of uh, what's been happening in the field of grain boundaries sort of in the last 20 years. And what I'll try to do is do it sort of as a tutorial. So this is not a review of the field. This is just sort of trying to trying to develop a uh, sort of a, a foundational understanding of it. So I hope, I hope it's not overly mathematical. I really tried to do a lot of pictures, not much math. Um, and what I'll try to do when I go through this is try to aim it, you know, for students or other scientists who are sort of new to the field or who haven't seen sort of the modern theory of what's going on in grain boundaries. Okay. So um, this is also the first uh, lecture in what we hope is a series of tutorials in material science that I think uh, the Hong Kong Institute for Advanced Study will then put up and make available around the world. So I hope, uh, I hope it, as a first one, I hope you find it useful. OK. So let me do a little bit of history. I'm not going to do a lot of history. One of my friends gave a talk like this recently, and he spent half of, half of his whole talk talking about history, and I won't do that. But let me just sort of remind you, this is a grain, these are grain boundaries in a microstructure. So these are different grains. The whole idea with a grain is they're all the same crystal structure, just different orientations in space. If you zoom in around here with um, atomic scale resolution, can actually go in and see the structure of the boundary. For me, I'm not that interested in the structure of the boundary per se. I'm more interested in the properties of grain boundaries and how it affects the evolution of materials. And so while, we're, while we talk about structure, we keep in mind structure for us is sort of the means for understanding everything else. It's not the goal in itself. So, this field is quite old, depending on when you call the beginning. You know, I've seen papers that are almost a century old now. And there's a lot of work in the field in the 20s, and then it kind of slowed down, and then again in the 60s and 80s and around 2000. And the interesting thing right now is there's a lot going on right now in the field, and that's what makes it exciting. And, you know, just like all of these things happen over time, you know, hopefully there's some evolution um, in terms of uh, what we understand. Okay, so what this is about. I'll be talking about grain boundary structure. I'll be talking about thermodynamic properties and dynamics of grain boundary, and especially how these things are interrelated. And I'm going to try to focus more on the ideas and the general concepts rather than all the details. And for now, I'm going to be focusing on pure materials. Um, if we want to talk about alloys, I'm happy to do it, but we'll need another four lectures. <laughs> so I won't be able to do it this time. So 
what this is not about. And the reason I mention this is because very often, you know, other people in the field get insulted if you don't mention them. So I found this cartoon, which I thought was a nice description about how to avoid <laughs> offending anybody. So I was starting from the beginning and saying, this is not a survey of the whole field. It's not a review. And in particular, what we're not doing is looking at segregation at interfaces. So again, we could save that for another time. And who's this for? As I mentioned, the idea is to focus on students, uh, scientists who are working in related areas. This is supposed to be related area, okay, test tubes. And the last one is scientists who are just looking for an update on what's been going on in the last uh, generation or so. So I'll be doing four lectures. These four lectures are on these topics. Today, I'm going to be focusing mostly on basic. So if you're a grain boundary expert, a lot of what I'm going to be telling you about today is review. I'll be talking about some basic ideas, talk about low angle grain boundaries and the structural unit model. The structural unit model is the place where we're going to start to sort of understand structure and from there many other properties. Then I'll talk a little bit about thermodynamics, metastability in grain boundaries, which is very important in grain boundaries defects in grain boundaries, dynamics. And then, you know, I can talk all about atomistics, but if we only talk about atomic scale structure, I won't get to talking about macroscopic properties and how a material evolves. And so I will, at the end, try to go through all the evolution, connect all these to evolution. And I, at the end of this series of lectures, I'll provide for you a list of references where you can see more of the details as well as some of the important other uh, work, not just by our group, but by many other groups. So I'll do that at the end. Okay, so here we go. So let's start at the beginning. What is a grain boundary? Okay, so strictly speaking, a grain boundary is a planar defect that uh, describes, that's the that's a, a, de a planar defect across which the orientation of the crystal changes, okay? And in some materials, it's atomically sharp. In some materials, it's spread out, or it could be spread out over nanometers, several nanometers. So what we have to do first is talk about orientation. So this is the crystal we're dealing with. It has its own frame of reference, and there's a laboratory frame. And so when we say that the orientation is, is discontinuous, as I go from here to here, the orientation changes from this to that, okay? So there's a discontinuity in the um, crystal orientation. That's fine, and this is nice when we're talking about a laboratory or a computer simulation where people make beautiful bicrystals. But in the real world, Grain boundaries are not so planar, not so beautiful like this. And to really understand grain boundaries, we can learn a lot from here, but eventually we have to get to the part here where we're talking about real microstructures. So just to give you an idea here, so this is a cross section through a microstructure. Again, these are grains with different orientation. The lines you see are the grain boundaries. If you see it in three dimensions, this is a fractured surface of calcite. And you can see there's grain boundaries, there's lines along which grain boundaries meet, and there's points along which these triple lines all meet. Okay, so the point is, grain boundaries are never infinitely long, infinitely large. They're almost never flat. They're only, they don't exist in isolation. They exist in a microstructure. And in a microstructure, what we're talking about is a spatial arrangement of grains and spatial arrangement of crystal orientations. We can also think about the, the networks of grain boundaries or of these triple lines. And so these are all networks, and the interconnectivity is going to be important, although we're not going to talk about it today. And typically, the way we interact with these microstructures is by thermomechanical processing, or synthesis. So depending on what kind of material you're dealing with. And 
there's a big tr there's been a trend in material science say in the last 30 years or so where people have tried to look at what they call grain boundary engineering which is the manipulation of the microstructure through processing to control what types of grain boundaries you have in there because different grain boundaries have different properties okay introduction why do we care about grain boundaries well Grain boundaries affect properties. So the classic example you, we usually talk about when we talk to sophomore students is we talk how, about how the yield strength varies with the grain size. And typically, so this is the yield strength should go like 1 over the square root of the grain size, D. And so if you apply the yield strength versus the inverse square root of grain size, you get a nice linear relationship. And that's the Hall-Petch relation here. However, in more recent years, people have observed very clear examples experimentally and in atomistic computer simulations, what people call the inverse Hall-Petch relation, which is to say, generally, as things get smaller, they get stronger. But the whole petch relation says there's a critical grain size uh, below which the strength decreases with decreasing size. It's the inverse whole petch relation. So in nanomaterials, we like to say smaller is stronger, and that's true until it's not, and smaller is weaker. Okay, if I look at fracture toughness versus grain size and different kinds of materials, this is now a ceramic material. You can see the fracture toughness goes up with increasing grain size. We can look at creep, and creep rates go down with increasing grain size, at least at very high temperatures. And every other mechanical property you can think of depends on grain size. Fatigue strength, um, pretty much anything you can think of depends on grain size. So the manipulation of grain size and manipulation of grain boundaries themselves is one of the knobs we use to control the properties of materials. And you know, although I like to start there because this is close to my heart, there's also many examples where grain boundaries affect electrical behavior and optical behavior. The most obvious one, the most common one, is in metallic systems. The electrical resistance goes up as the grain size goes down. Grain boundaries are good scatterers. In semiconductor, grain boundaries can be recombination sites. In, poly in varistors, in ceramic varistors, electrical breakdown occurs at the grain boundaries. If I look at superionic ceramics, the conductivity goes up as the grain size goes down. In some 2D materials, I'm also not going to talk about this during this uh, series of lectures, but we've also been looking at how um, in, in a number of 2D's materials, for example, the transition metal dichalcogenides, many of those are semiconductors, but the grain boundaries themselves can be metallic. So that means manipulating grain size basically means making wires through the, you know, conducting paths through the material. Optical transparency, well, in polycrystalline materials, so you get diffuse scattering at grain boundaries. So as the grain size goes down, more diffuse scattering in solar cells. Photoluminescence quantum yields, or conversion efficiency goes up as the grain size goes up. Again, because in many of these cases, grain boundaries are detrimental. Not all of them. In, in the varistor example, varistors only work because of the grain boundaries. OK. So that's just a small set of cases where the properties are, are modified and can be manipulated through control grain size and microstructure, grain size and grain boundary types. Okay. I'm going to start today, and a lot of the lecture today is going to be talking about free surfaces, and then I'll talk about low angle grain boundaries. And the reason I'm talking about surfaces is surfaces two-dimensional interfaces between a crystal and a vacuum are a very nice kind of interface and there's a lot of analogies with grain boundaries so a lot of this is easier to understand first in crystal in the surfaces then i'll talk about low angle grain boundaries 
and then we'll go to high angle grain boundaries, and then we'll start talking about crystallography. And if I get through all that today, I'm good. Okay. Okay. So, the experts in the audience will recognize this is body center cubic. Um, if I cleave that crystal, I can create different surfaces. So these are low index or high symmetry crystals. So I can talk about the normal to the surface. You know, so this is the PQR direction is the normal here, 111, 110, 100. And the surfaces then are characterized by the normal. So that's the plane. So this is the family of planes, PQR. And if you look at the atomic structure here, not just the symmetry of the surface depends on which plane, but in de the detailed atomic structure is also depends on which plane you cleave along. Okay? And this is sort of an interesting surface, and in fact, it's actually quite common. Um, for example, if this is a face and cubic material, this is the 11, 13, 19 surface. And what you see on here are terraces, these flat regions, or facets. You see ledges, or steps. And on those ledges, you see kinks, okay? Exactly the same thing happens on grain boundaries, okay? So it's going to look at this, and, and you can actually derive a lot of properties of surfaces and a lot of properties of grain boundaries by just looking at this level of information. Because it's, it's the simplest connection between crystal structure, which surface you choose, the crystallography of the surface, and the structure, okay? And clearly, if you take, this is sort of just a sphere cut from here, and you can see that the sphere, if you just cut it, you'll see 111 surfaces, 100 surfaces, 110 surfaces. So if I want to talk about the surface normal here, the normal to the surface, there are two degrees of freedom. So if I have a surface here and I want to describe the normal direction to the surface, which is essentially the same as describing the surface plane, that normal is described by these three parameters, PQR. And it turns out that there's only two parameters there, though, because the surface normal is a unit normal, which is to say you also have the one extra condition that P squared plus Q squared plus R squared should be equal to 1. Okay, it's a unit normal. Okay, so what this says is if you specify two angles, you know, I can talk about an angle this way and an angle that way. If I specify the two angles, I've also specified the surface, at least in terms of macroscopic properties, macroscopic degrees of freedom. Okay, so you have two parameters there. Okay. So let's talk about, um, we're going to start talking about grain boundaries. So the first thing we have to talk about in grain boundaries is the following. So if this is a crystal here, since the choice of a lab frame is arbitrary, I can put the axes in any direction I want. And so if I specify what the lab frame is here, when I choose the orientation of one crystal, it's arbitrary because this choice of axes is arbitrary. Now, sorry, I need two hands for this. So once I specify the orientation of one crystal, then when I'm talking about the misorientation between two grains, I can now talk about the orientation of these axes relative to this one, okay? So choosing this costs me nothing because it's arbitrary which axes I choose. But once I choose that, then the relative orientation of this crystal relative to this one, that's a macroscopic, one of the macroscopic degrees of freedom. And in fact, it's three macroscopic degrees of freedom. So just like an airplane, you could talk about the pitch, 
the Rho and the Yaw. Or if I talk about the crystal frame, you know, I can talk about the orientation of the three vectors uh, for the orientation of the crystal. So I need three parameters or three angles to define the misorientation. Okay? So not the orientation of the grains, the misorientation. So in this field, there are many ways to do that. And it just depends on how you grew up, <laughs> what your background is, which language you're comfortable with, you're most comfortable with. So there are many ways to do it. I can specify three angles. So I can specify a set of Euler angles. It's a choice. Or I can say, well, if here's a grain one and grain two, I pick one direction here. And then if I misorient the two crystals relative to each other, I can then talk about this axis here, the theta one axis. Or if I pick an orthogonal rotation axis, so the rotation axis coming out of the plane here, that's another angle. Or I can twist one grain route to the other, and that's a third angle. So I can specify three angles, three, mis three orientation angles, or three. Um, so specifying these three angles is the same thing as specifying the three angles that you use in uh, aerodynamics. OK, another way of doing it is if you specify, you can specify a rotation axis. And it could be in any orientation. So if I specify that axis, it's a direction in space. And since it's just a direction, it doesn't have a magnitude. So there are two parameters associated with the orientation of the axis, plus one extra degree of freedom, which is the rotation about that axis. OK, so depending on how you like to do it, any of these ways of doing it is fine. And the reason I'm going through it is People use all of them. I mean, there's actually, there's actually like three or four more ways of doing this, which I'm not going to go through all of them. But I just want to make you aware that there's three ways of doing it. And so there are three degrees of freedom associated with the orientation of one crystal with respect to the other. OK. If I, part of what I'm doing is sort of setting up the language for you. So, if you pick a rotation axis which is perpendicular to the grain boundary plane and rotate about that, then you have a pure tilt grain, a twist grain boundary. Okay, so the twist grain boundary is characterized by a rotation axis perpendicular to the plane of the grain boundary. A tilt grain boundary just means that the rotation axis lies in the plane of the grain boundary. And since it's a plane, there are two degrees of freedom. I can do this way or that way, any way there. And if there's mirror symmetry across the grain boundary, then we call that a symmetric tilt boundary. OK? Sorry, I'm just trying to get through the notation. <laughs> This field has a lot of language in it, unfortunately, like a lot of other things. So we can also talk about a mixed grain boundary and an asymmetric grain boundary. And it's easiest if we talk about it relative to the, uh, the picture here. So what we're going to do is imagine that the two grains here and here are misoriented with respect to each other. So if O is the rotation axis, and I rotate about there, since the rotation axis O is perpendicular to this plane, that's a twist grain boundary. Here's the symmetric grain boundary, where I start with a crystal here, and I rotate one down by theta over 2, the other up by theta over 2, such that has a mirror symmetry. That would be a symmetric grain boundary. And now, if I misorient the two crystals relative to each other, but I instead of putting the plane right there in the symmetric orientation, if I rotate it up like this, we have an asymmetric tilt boundary. And it's still a tilt grain boundary because you see that the, great, that the rotation axis still lies in the plane of the grain boundary, but it's no longer symmetric. Okay. And the last one is a mixed grain boundary, which is a combination of a t 
of a tilt and a twist, which is to say that the, the rotation axis is neither in the plane of the boundary or perpendicular to the boundary, it's just some other orientation. So a general grain boundary is a grain boundary which is sort of mixed tilt and twist and asymmetric. Asymmetric tells me about the orientation of the plane. Mixed tells me about the, where the rotation axis in the misorientation is. Okay? Good so far? Okay, good. Uh, so, one last one. I can take a grain boundary, which is, say, mixed, or one which is asymmetric, and I can decompose this boundary, for example, into parts which are symmetric and the parts that go off at another angle. And so here is just breaking up an asymmetric boundary into, um, into combinations of different planes. And so this is a faceted grain boundary. And usually those planes here are much higher symmetry than the one that's here. Now there's a thermodynamic condition for this. But right now we're just doing structure, so we'll come back. We're not going to worry about it now. And you can do it where you have a combination. This is a case where you take one of the mixed boundaries and you can do combinations of twist of twist grain boundaries and even symmetric tilt boundaries. It's a combination of those. Okay. A little bit more about degrees of freedom. Okay, so once we have the relative orientation of the two crystals specified, so this blue cube and this red cube, you can see that they have some arbitrary orientation relative to each other. That's three degrees of freedom. And if I cut, if I interpenetrate those two lattices, I can cut and make the, make the surface for the grain boundary right here, or you can pick any plane here. So these are two green planes. And that just shows the inclination degrees of freedom. So now's the math part. 3 plus 2 equals 5. OK? There are five macroscopic bicrystallographic degrees of freedom associated with the grain boundary three from the misorientation and two from the inclination. Altogether, there are five. And one of the things we've done here is we've not really worried so much about what the structure of the crystal is. So this idea works for structureless grains, right? All I need is to be able to draw some axes in there, but that's all. So it doesn't depend on the crystal structure or the atomic structure of the grain boundary. That's all a separate issue, which we'll talk about next. Okay? So again, five macroscopic degrees of freedom. Now we'll talk about the microscopic degrees of freedom. Okay? You know, all the stuff up to now is we're just learning how to count. Counting is important. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to talk about the microscopic degrees of freedom. So surprisingly, each grain actually has a real live crystal structure. Well, not live, but a real crystal structure. And so if I do things like, for example, if I shift one grain relative to the other, parallel to the grain, that has no effect on the five bicrystallographic macroscopic degrees of freedom, right? Because I haven't changed the boundary plane. I haven't changed the misorientation. I'm just changing the shift. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because there are actually atoms there. And if I take a grain boundary where I put it together like this, and if I slide it some arbitrary amount, the structure of those two boundaries will be different. So that's a microscopic degree of freedom. So if I tell you the crystallography, I've told you nothing about the microscopic degrees of freedom. Okay, 
So here, what I'm showing is a specific kind of shift. So these are shifts of one grain relative to the other, but the shift is parallel to the great boundary plane. Okay. Now, to slide one grain relative to the other, I don't have to add any atoms or remove any atoms to do that sliding. So we call this a conservative degree of freedom. And there's two of them because I can slide the one grain relative to the other two directions. So this direction or that direction or any combination of the two. There's one more though, which basically means I'm translating one grain relative to the other in this direction. Now, normally I don't have to think about this. Now, why don't I have to think about this? Because if I tell you how the two grains are oriented, and I tell you how far I push them this way, you don't get to choose how close they are. They'll just move. You know, when you minimize the energy, they just go equilibrium. They go to some very particular separation. So the only way I really can manipulate this degree of freedom, this microscopic degree of freedom, is if I add or remove atoms from the grain boundary. Okay? So adding or removing atoms from the grain boundary means that it's a non-conservative process because the total number of atoms has changed. Okay? And adding, you know, if I take a grain boundary and it has, say, I don't know, uh, 15 atoms per square nanometer on the grain boundary plane, and I add two more, it shifts the two crystals apart by some amount, and that's this kind of degree of freedom. It's very important when we talk about segregation, very important when we talk about creep, it's very important when we talk about surface on this grain boundary. And as I'll show you, I suppose next time, is very interesting things you can do to the grain boundary structure by adding or removing atoms. And by the way, this is, this is very related to what you do in radiation damage, where a grain boundary can absorb or emit vacancies or interstitial. That's adding and removing atoms. So radiation damage is one of those places where this is central. Okay. Let me go back to surfaces now. I'm going to surfaces before I go to low angle grain boundaries in detail because I want to give you some idea here. Okay, so as I said before, this is a vicinal grain bound, a vicinal surface, which is to say that this surface here, the terraces, usually are very low energy surfaces. Like for example, an FCC, a 111 surface would probably be a pretty low energy surface. And so if I miscut it by a couple degrees off from there, then I'm going to get this ledge or step and kink structure. And half the game, if I'm trying to understand how the energy of the surface depends on the miscut angle, all I really need to do is count up how many atoms I have on terraces, how many atoms I have on steps, and how many atoms I have in kinks per unit area of the surface. And the reason you know that is because if I look at, you know, if I look at this surface, there are many fewer broken bonds compared to the perfect crystal on the terrace, more broken bonds on the step, and even more broken bonds at the kink. So if I do a really simple model, I just say it's an energy cost for breaking bonds, so all I have to do is count how many are broken, and how many I have per unit area. And I have my first estimate of energy. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. So this is sort of a very simple version of that, where each block here, I can think about as representing some unit of the grain boundary uh, surface, okay? So on the surface, I can think of the surface as being made up of structural units of two types. I'm ignoring kinks for now just to make my life a little easier. But if I look at this surface, I have these kinds of units, and I have this kind of 
locally, the bonding is very different. There's two kinds of units. There's more broken bonds here than there are there. So we're going to think of a structure as made of structural units. I can think of terrace units and step units. And each one has a fixed number of broken bonds and a particular bonding topology. Okay. So changing the miscut angle by a little bit, what does it do? It doesn't really change what these units are. It doesn't change what those units are. It just changes the relative abundance of the two. OK? So the simplest way to look at the energy of a surface is just to count these things up and say, how does it on the orientation of the surface? OK? So this is the idea of a structural unit. <clears throat> Switch to boundaries. Now, if I take two vicinal surfaces and I put them together, they also have steps and terraces on them. When I put them together, the atoms are sitting right here and the atoms are sitting right there. I want to get close together to get the, the appropriate bond length for this material. So these will squeeze together. This will get pushed back a little. These will get pulled together a little bit. And when I put it together, I end up with a low angle grain boundary, which instead of having steps like this, I could think of as having edge dislocations here. And the way to think about those edge dislocations is you can think of an extra half plane terminating right here. Or in this picture, here's the plane terminates right there. When I put it together, I have a picture like that. And many of us who've done these things before, the first thing you learn is what we call the Reed-Shockley model, which just relates the Berger's vector of this dislocation and the spacing between them to the misorientation angle here. And um, this is a, a high-resolution micrograph from uh, Ikohara's group in Tokyo. This is strontium titanate. And you can see a very clear view that looks like that. Ceramics are nice because they have large unit cells compared to metals, so easier to look at these pictures. Okay, so the thing I want to remind you of here is if I look at the bonding topology, each atom here has four bonds. For this atom, one, two, three, four. So the atoms in here also have four bonds arranged. The topology of the bonding is the same here as it is here. But over here where I see the dislocation, you can see the bonding is different. So here, if I look around here, I've got four sides of the square. Here I got one, two, three, four, five. Four sides here, five sides there. So I can think of a low angle grain boundary as being composed of two kinds of units. I can think of it as a perfect crystal unit plus an edge dislocation core unit. Okay? Now, that's just about bonding topology. I haven't said anything about strains yet. Because you know, one of the things you see is out here, this material is going to be strained, but when I go far enough away, it looks perfect again. So that's actually a really important thing. So far from the grain boundary, the crystals are perfect, and this localized bonding change is very localized. Okay? So again, the idea of structural units, like we have on the surfaces, we also have here in low angle boundaries, and as, as I will demonstrate, you also have it in high angle boundaries. Okay. Very quickly, the sophomore level review of dislocations. And I'm, I know you all know about this. I'm doing it just because later on we're going to be talking about the characteristics of the defect in a grain boundary. And so we just have to make sure we're on the same place, at least in terms of nomenclature. So an edge dislocation. What is an edge dislocation? It's a dislocation for which the Berger's vector is perpendicular to the line direction. B and C. So they're both vectors. B, the Berger's vector, is a property of the dislocation. 
So I don't care whether the dislocation bends around in any which way, the Burgers vector is conserved. The line direction, C, moves tangent to the line direction. So if I bend the dislocation here, I have a perfect edge here. If I bend it around here, the Burgers vector is this direction. Here, C is parallel to it, so that's a screw. Here is perpendicular, so that's an edge. And again, Burgers vector is conserved. Line direction goes whichever way the line goes. Okay. The important point for us right now is the following. If I look at the stress field of a dislocation, it decays away from the dislocation line, like 1 over r, and its magnitude is, is, um, is proportional to the Burgers vector itself. Okay? So it's 1 over r. 1 over r is a very, very slow decay. It's a very long-range interaction. If I look at the energy per unit length from the elasticity, the energy goes like the logarithm of the size of your crystal. So this energy for an infinite crystal is infinite. Okay? So dislocations are characterized by this very, very, very long-range elastic stress field. Okay? And the consequent is the energy diverges with size. This part's a core energy, and that's just characteristic of the broken bonds out here. Okay? Oh, and RC is a cutoff, <coughs> excuse me, which is um, a number which is, it's a length scale which tells me how big the core is. And in fact, it's not clear exactly how big RC is, so if you make RC a little bigger, you just have to change EC to compensate. Okay? So it's not unique. Okay. Now, go back to the low angle grain boundary here. This low angle grain boundary can be described as an array of edge dislocations, which you see right there. It's an array of edge dislocations. The interesting thing about the stress field and the strain field of a grain boundary, which is all made of these, these edge dislocations, is the stress field decays exponentially fast away from the grain boundary. It decays faster than power law, much, much faster, much, 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 much faster than the 1 over r. It's periodic in this direction. That's not surprising. So in fact, all the stresses sort of vary with distance from the grain boundary is x e to the minus x. And the relaxation distance is proportional to the spacing between them, d. Okay? Now, that's the elastic field. So if I know what the stress field is, and I'm given the stress field, I can calculate the elastic energy. If I calculate the elastic energy, this is the elastic energy of the grain boundary, which we call gamma. And that energy goes per energy per unit area of the grain boundary goes proportional to the square of the Burgers vector, one over the spacing between dislocations, and goes logarithmically with that spacing as well. So it's, it's one over d log d. And if I then relay d to b and theta like this, I can say it just goes, gamma zero should go like, oops, should be mu b squared. Sorry, let's draw the two. Uh, that's just elastic constants. And these two things here are the things which are going to be related to the core part. And this is the classic energy, the Reed-Shockley energy of a grain boundary. And I'll say more about it in a minute. <clears throat> a couple things about it. This is a number. It doesn't depend on distance, right? There's nothing that depends on how far I am here. And that's because the, the stress fields and the strain fields decay so fast that when you integrate them, it integrates to a constant. Okay? 
And the reason it does that, so if you have one dislocation, you have a monopole, that dislocation, the stress field goes like 1 over r. If I make a dipole, plus and minus, it goes like 1 over r squared. This is like a multipole, like monopole, dipole, etc., quadrupole, etc. And if you have any kind of multipolar arrangement of dislocation, it's stress will decay like 1 over r to some power. And it's because you have an infinite array that it actually decays exponentially fast. So that's kind of a cute little reason, but that's why a grain boundary energy is finite. Okay? So does it work? So these are some experiments, which are rather quite old, and some uh, simulations. So this is a simulation, a relatively simple uh, case. So this is grain boundary energy versus tilt angle. And this is, these are actual data. And if you look here, this is the best fit reed shockley form to that. Now, if I look at that, I'd say, well, it does remarkably well when the angle is very small. And when the angle is small, it means that the dislocations are very far apart. When those dislocations get closer and closer together, the energy is no longer determined by the long-range elastic field. Because remember, the energy goes like, uh, the stress field goes like e to the minus distance over the spacing. So when they get very, very close together, elasticity is just not dominating the energy anymore. And what dominates the energy is the bonding at the core of the dislocation. Okay? So when the angle gets big, I can't think of this as a perfect crystal with elastic distortions. It's something else. And that's something else is what we'll be talking about for quite a while. Okay? This is some, ex this is some experimental data here. This is a 111 tilt axis in aluminum. This is gamma as a function of misorientation. And the point is you see many cusps. Why do you see cusps? Well, there are very special orientations of a grain boundary that correspond to very high symmetry arrangements, or arrangements where very few bonds are broken. So for example, if I look at a twin in an FCC material, I basically break no bonds. And so the energy should not be zero, but it's very close to zero, OK? So real grain boundaries typically show multiple cusps, and that's a fundamental part of it. And we'll talk about where that comes from in a minute. But again, this is just showing the grain boundary energy versus disorientation. The takeaway point here is that the reed shockley model, which is based on elasticity, works very well as long as the dislocations are far apart. Or since we talk about these in terms of structural units, as long as you have one kind of structural unit, perfect crystal, and the dislocations, which is the minority structural unit, very far apart. Okay. That's going to be a theme we're going to use when we go to high angle grain boundaries. Okay. Just a quick comment. If I'm talking about twist boundaries, I can't do this with edges. The only way I can get a twist is with screw dislocations. And when you're dealing, if I had a planar array of parallel screw dislocations, the stress field out at very large distance will be constant at large distances. And the only way to screen it is by having an array of two or three sets of other dis of dislocations in there. So now looking down the plane of the grain boundary, this is a simulation. And again, this is some work in this time in Sapphire, again from Ikahara's group. You know, very nice planar arrangement of dislocations. OK, all this I did because I want to introduce a certain set of concepts that we're going to use throughout the rest of these lectures. So what are those concepts? Let me just summarize them for you. So first, planar interfaces, where we're talking about surfaces or grain boundaries, can be characterized as an array of repeating structural units. 
we will always need at least two types of structural units if we want to describe how the structure or the properties depend on orientation, crystallography. And each of those structural units has a unique atomic structure and bonding topology. That part is very local, right? That part is very local. And so when I talk about structural units, I'm not talking about strained fields. I'm only talking about what the bonding arrangement looks like. And so it's very localized. <laughs> OK. How many structural units of each type you have depends on, say, for example, the if I take a visceral surface, like how much of a miscut it is. So if I if I start with a, a flat surface and I miscut it by two degrees, I will have a certain number of steps per unit distance or per unit area. If I increase the angle, I'll have more steps per unit length, right? If I increase the misorientation between two crystals in the Langle brain boundary, then as that misorientation increases, the spacing between dislocations gets smaller and smaller. So this part is telling me about the units. The crystallography is telling about how many I have as a function of the macroscopic degrees of freedom. OK? Two important ingredients. OK. Um, when we're talking about vicinal surfaces, which is almost a perfectly flat surface, or I'm talking about a low ankle grain boundaries, one of those units is very special. If I have a vicinal, if I have a flat surface, you know, all one, one, one surface, those units are really perfect. If I'm talking about a low ankle grain boundary, the majority of the units are perfect crystals, right? So that's very simple, and that's special for visceral surfaces and low angle grain boundaries. When I go from a surface to a grain boundary, the most important piece I have to get right is the elasticity. That is to say, if I have a free surface and I make a step, there's no long range elastic field. If you do a grain boundary and these are edge dislocations, the decay length of the elastic field is 1 over r away from every one of those dislocations. Getting the elasticity right is an essential ingredient when we're talking about grain boundaries, not for surfaces. Although there's a, there are interesting effects for elasticity on surfaces too, but that's another lecture. OK. And so, in order to describe, for example, the grain boundary energy or the grain boundary structure, I need three main ingredients. I need to be able to identify the structural units, that is, the structure of the core and how they're bonded together. I need to be able to describe the long range elastic fields associated with that. And I need to know as I change the relative degrees of freedom, the five degrees of freedom, I need to know how those changes affect the relative abundance of those structural units. Okay, so those are all the essential ingredients. Okay, for the modeling people, all right, just thinking about this, I need to know three things. I need to know about bonding. So for those of us who do calculations, this usually means we have to do electronic structure calculations, or at least interatomic potentials. Once I have that, I can then talk about what is the atomic structure of the boundary. And then from there, I have to go to the elasticity. And then I need the crystallography to connect all those things. Okay. So to do this right, this is an intrinsically multi-scale problem. The art in simulating grain boundaries is to do the right part of the problem with the right method. Okay? It's easy to get it wrong. Okay, so I will now describe for you how to do high angle grain boundaries. I'm going to use exactly the same idea. I'm not going to go through a lot of detail, but I try to show you that the ideas are exactly the same as in low angle boundaries. 
Okay, so the structural unit model dates back to the 70s or 80s, depending on which papers you'd like to reference. Okay, you're always going to the bishop in 1968, but he just had a simple idea. Okay, so this is, we're talking about a 100 tilt axis, symmetric grain boundaries. And what I'm just going to do is change the misorientation angle from zero degrees to 19 degrees to 23 degrees to 37 to 53 to 90. So this is a, uh, this is a, a cubic material. So when I do the special boundary where the misorientation is zero, that's just another way of saying there's no grain boundary. So all of the units are exactly the same and they're characteristic of the crystal structure. If I take this grain boundary, I rotate it so now they're 90 degrees apart, and it's a 100 tilt axis, and the 100 axis in BCC is an axis where there's a four-fold symmetry. So if I rotate by 90 degrees, I also have a perfect crystal, okay? Now, the interesting thing is what happens in between. Okay, so let's go to this very special case here, 36.87 degrees. That's how the numbers work out. This one's very special because this is the case where I've taken the crystal, I've misoriented it in such a way. So this angle here is 36.87 degrees. And you can see if I look at the structural unit, there's basically one unit here. And it just repeats, repeats. Here, it just repeats, repeats. Here, it repeats, repeats. Okay, so this angle zero and that angle 90 degrees basically correspond to a case where I have a low angle bound, well, I can think about it as a, like a visceral surface, where if I take it, say, for example, cut it at 100 or, or 010, it's exactly the same. Just change the orientation. This is a special one. I'll tell you about it later on called sigma phi boundary. The interesting thing I want to point out is if you look between zero degrees and 36.87 degrees, the structure is just a combination of the units from here, perfect crystal, and the units from here. And I'm just control, so this is alternating A, you know, I call these units A, call these units C. This just goes A, C, A, C, et cetera, okay? It's a one-to-one -one correspondence of A units and C units. Now, if I go to another, another angle, which is closer to zero than it is to 36.87, again, I have A units and C units. But now it goes A, A, C, A, A, C, et cetera, okay? If I went to 10 degrees, it would go A, 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 C, A, 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 C, et cetera, okay? So these units here are basically playing the role, just like those edge dislocations. These units here are perfect crystal units, like in the low angle boundary. These are perfect crystal units and that's like the dislocation, okay? So the idea is that any grain boundary can be described in a certain orientation range as just a combination of two kinds of units, okay? And so these we call delimiting units because it just repeats C, C, B, B, B. Don't worry about why we call them A or B. We'll talk about that later, okay? So it just repeats one kind of unit here. So A and B and C are all delimiting ones. Anything in between A and C has to be just some combination of those two things. Okay? Now, how many of each unit do I have? Well, it depends on the size of that unit. PA and PC, those are the size that way. 
Theta C corresponds to 36.87, where I only have C units. This one, theta A, corresponds to zero degrees. And so the combination, the ratio of the number of A units to C units just depends on the size of the units and these angles, okay? So not only do I know that they're composed of all of A and C units, I even know how many of them there are, okay? One last piece, and then we can pull it together and do an energy. Um, the last thing I want to do here is consider the question of what order do I put them in? Do I have A, 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 C, 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 A, 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 C, 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 or do I go A, C, A, C, A, C? So here's the way to think about it. If I think about these as edge dislocations, they have a Burgers vector. And two dislocations with the same Burgers vector repel each other. So what I'm trying to do is I want to arrange them so they'll be as far apart from each other as possible, because that minimizes the elastic energy. Okay, so that tells me what the sequence is. Okay, and that's because these all have Burgers vectors. But here's another thing that I think is important to think about. If I look at this boundary here, this boundary has some misorientation. And just like we knew before, if I have this misorientation, I can describe it by an array of dislocations like that. Now, if I say that this is my perfect material, I'm going to define my perfect material as one where I have a regular array of some kind of unit. And they're so close together that the elastic energy is very small. Okay. Now, when I put in these minority units like this, that's like adding extra dislocations. So that's like taking this and replacing some of the red ones with blue dislocations, which have a different Burgers vector. Since they were different Burgers vector, when I change the Burgers vector, I rotate the lattice. And then um, I can think about these things as these minority units as a different kind of dislocation. And in the field, we call this, we call these secondary grain boundary dislocations. Okay? So these may be, you could think about these as like primary and these as secondary. Okay? So the point is the perfect crystal, the perfect grain boundary here is a delimiting boundary, but it's not necessarily a crystal. It's periodic, but with a periodicity in this direction not in the other ones, okay? So again, the whole idea is I'm going to think about this just like we do with the low angle grain boundary, but before we talked about dislocations, now we're talking about the low angle grain boundary here where this is like our perfect crystal, and the only thing we then have to worry about is these minority units, okay? So again, structural units, there's two types of structural units. It could be a perfect crystal and a dislocation, or it could be one kind of dislocation and another kind of dislocation. Okay? So that's how they're arranged. And I can estimate how many of these kinds of units I have, NA and NB. I did that before. And so if I pick, if I know what PA and PC were, which were, this, which were the size of each unit, and I want to find out how many units of each type in a periodic system. It's interesting that the only time you'll get a periodic system is when this equation works, which is basically the same. You know, I could have A, 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 B, A, 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 B, but I could also have, you know, 27 units of one on average and 13.6 units of the other. You know, so the combination could be irrational. And most grain boundaries are irrational, which is to say the structure is not truly periodic. It could be nice and periodic for a long distance, and then you have to have one extra dislocation. And then nice and periodic again, and then one extra dislocation. 
If it's not arranged in a regular way, we call this an irrational boundary because it doesn't satisfy that equation. But that's okay. It has no phys It doesn't matter at all physically. It makes my life complicated when I try to calculate it, but it has no effect on the physics. Okay. So people tell you about a rational boundary and irrational boundary. You should forget all that. There's no difference between the two, except whether it's a regular or an irregular arrangement. OK, uh, let's see. I think I'll do the crystallography the next time. So let me just do energy and a couple more slides. And I'll try to go through that kind of quickly. But I know we'll get this. Try not to make this a two-hour lecture. OK, so again, the important thing is we need to be able to s describe the grain boundary structural unit, which is the core energy, like the core of a dislocation, and then an elastic energy. And the whole energy is just the sum of those two. OK, so I'm not going to derive it for you, but it comes from an argument like I showed you before. So if I look at the core energy, that the grain boundary energy is associated with the bonding disruption, so energy per unit area. It depends on the energy per unit area of the delimiting boundary. You know, the limiting boundary is like C, 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 C. And this one could be D, 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 D. And anywhere, well, I call this X and Y. So anywhere in between, I know this part, nx, and these angles tell me about how many I have per unit area. And this is some way I have to get the energy of that special boundary, the delimiting boundary here. So p is the spacing, is the periodicity of the whole structure. Looks like that. It's just work. And the ratio of the number of units of each is the same as I showed you before. OK? So these things, I have to get it from the energy of the delimiting boundaries by whatever method I can think of. OK, so that's the core energy. The elastic energy, well, the elastic energy is just energies of dislocations. And the energy of an array of dislocations is exactly what I told you before. But in fact, what I actually have to do is solve for this, you know, if I tell you the value of theta, I've got to plug in the, I've got to put in the values of D, the spacing there. So low angle boundary, it just goes like sine of the angle. That's the core size, that's the spacing. And so the real way to do it was uh, actually derived by uh, J.C.M. Lee. C.T., you may be the only one here who remembers J.C.M. Lee besides me. <laughs> you remember him from um, Rochester. Yeah. Um, so he, here's a way of doing it. So here's the final idea. If I look at a grain boundary here of a certain delimiting orientation theta A, with another delimiting orientation theta B, that just means they're all A units here, all B units here. These are the delimiting boundaries. And so that looks like this. OK? Now, if I go in between, I just have combinations. So this is A, B, A, B, A, B. And this one is more A's than B because I'm closer to this angle. OK? And now if I plug into the elasticity formula, if I know this energy, you know, the core energy of this one, core energy of that one, I can interpolate every place in between using elasticity and crystallography. I don't have to do any other calculations. I don't have to do any other measurements. I just get that. OK? Now, if you do that, you'll get very bad results. <laughs> and the reason you get very bad results is the following. If I think about B as the minority unit, it's like a dislocation. But if the dislocations get very close together, low angle gray boundary, Reed Shockley fails. And so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say A and B together, I'll call that one unit. I'll call that unit C. Okay? 
So whenever they get too close together, I'll just define another unit, structural unit, which is a combination of this and this. And that's unit C. So any place in between this orientation, this one here, which is at the limiting boundary, all C's, and this one, which is all A's, is now just a combination of A's and C's. So I take this A and B and call it C. A and B and call it C. A and B and call it C. OK? So then this, instead of being the hot, most difficult boundary to look at, becomes the easiest one. OK? So what does that do? So if I have another limiting boundary, which is C, it's going to always give me a cusp. And then to look in between these two, all I have to do is apply the same elasticity formula again. And in fact, I can keep doing this, because now when C's get too close together, I can define a new unit, which is this A and C. And I can describe this more accurately. So if you really want to look at any grain boundary, you're always going to see tiny cusps. The higher the resolution you look, the more cusps you'll have. Okay? But the elasticity takes care of it all, and the counting of units takes care of it all. And that just comes from simple linear elasticity and simple uh, crystallography. Okay. So the interesting thing about this is if I know the energy of these two, I can make this iteratively improve this to get a higher and higher accuracy just by just putting smaller, just by redefining the units and doing a better and better job with the elasticity. Okay, so how does it work? So here's, I'll do one example for you, and then we'll call it quits. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is an angle range between 36.87 and 53.13. Those are not randomly chosen. Those correspond to the grain boundary plane being 0, 1, 2 for this one, and the plane being 0, 1, 3 for that one. OK, so now if I look at the structural units, this one I call G, this one I call H, and in between is just a combination of those. OK? So if I just say, what's the core energy? I only know the value of this one and this one. That's the core energy. I didn't get that from a, a simple calculation for a very small periodic boundary, limiting boundaries. I get that point and that point. So this is the core energy. If I want to be more accurate, I can pick somewhere in between corresponding to G, H, G, H, G, H. And I can calculate the energy of that delimiting boundary. So that's just these curves. Rest of this is all from just doing the elasticity calculation. Okay, And the thing I want to point out to you is the following. So if I just use this boundary and this boundary information, elasticity gives me the black curve. If I want to say I'm going to combine the units G and H and call them something else, K, then every time I do that, I'll get a new cusp. And I can get more and more resolution just by dividing it like that. And if I really want to be accurate, I can do another, if I do an atomistic calculation here, a DFT calculation here, and one there, I'll get the black curve or the solid red curve. If I want to be more accurate, I can actually calculate the energy of this very special boundary. And so if you look in this region here, it shifts it down by a tiny bit. And so if I now compare this with atomistic simulation, so each of those green dots is an atomistic simulation, the red curve is only based on two calculations. And the dash curve, the red dash curve, is based on three calculations. <laughs> so I can do calculations on just a couple of grain boundaries and predict the entire curve because elasticity does that for me. And I can iteratively improve it by doing one more calculation. I can improve the accuracy of the whole thing. So if I want to compare with atomistic calculations, I can get within half a percent by doing five calculations. So that's basically because you're taking everything, 
we're doing very, we're doing identifying structural units. Once I understand the structural units, it's just math to do that correct the crystallography, the misorientation. And then I do elasticity. But you know, all this is very, very simple calculations. And because we're combining the local information of bonding disruption here, and this part then, the other details, just comes all from the elasticity and the crystallography. And that's it. The point is, you can, if you understand what the structure is, understand what it implies about the elasticity and the crystallography, you can then predict the whole thing. OK, so. I was going to start talking about bicrystallography, but I think we're going to have to wait for that for next time. Uh, so let me end in the following way. So what we've learned here so far is the following. Any kind of planar defect I can describe by basic structural units. In the case of grain boundaries, those structural units correspond to dislocations. Those dislocations we'll talk about next time. I'll tell you how to figure out what Berger's vectors are allowed. But they're just dislocations. And I understand by doing the simple crystallography, I can connect all this together. So I can identify the structural units. Crystallography tells me how the number of those units are determined. If I know how the number is determined, then I can do an elasticity calculation to get the elastic fields from which I can calculate the elastic energy. A grain boundary energy is a combination of the energy of the broken bonds at the cores of this location and the elastic energy. The core part, since it's about bonding and detailed atomic structure, there's no way to get that theoretically. You just have to do a, a bonding type calculation, atomistic, like molecular dynamics or density functional theory. But once you have information about a few of those kinds of bonding topologies, you can then describe the whole thing by combining that with crystallography and elasticity. And I'll pick it up from there next time, and we'll actually start talking about crystallography in more detail. So sorry, I went over. I just figured I could go on next time, but I wanted to finish one subtopic. So thank you for your attention, and we'll pick it up again next week. So thank you for the class. <laughs>
the interesting cases are situations where uh, you have interstitials and substance interstitials. Yeah. So you can look at segregation here by calculating what the energy of, of uh, the solute is in each of those cores. But the thing that we haven't talked about yet, and I will start talking about next time, is you can also have in grain boundaries metastable structures. You can have metastable structures in grain boundary by shifting the grain boundary this way. But the best way to get metastable structures is by allowing segregation. So I'm not going to talk about that during these lectures, but if, uh, if Jacob wants me to, I can do the next four lectures <laughs> on the segregation piece. Um, no, it's a very interesting question. It's just all I'm trying to do in this series of lectures is stick completely with the structural part because we can be very predictive on the structural part. In the, when we talk about composition, there's really no alternative to actually doing a lot of detailed bonding or DFT type of calculations. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have those, and I'll, I'll talk about those in some of the other lectures. I'm just trying to get some of the ideas across here first, just to build it up. Uh, um, the simplest way to make direct comparisons is not in the energy, because measuring grain boundary energy is not a very accurate thing. But structure, if you do, if you do high resolution TEM, you can look at the details of the structure and see how that varies. And so it, that's more where the comparisons will be. But I, I would say that the issues with getting grain boundary energies act, getting grain boundary accurately, it's much more difficult on the experimental side than it is on the calculation side. I do. <laughs> right, grain size and all grain boundaries are the same. Right, not a good way to do grain boundary engineering. Yeah. When I was a student, people usually argue with a high angle boundary does have a regulation or not. Okay. A what? Uh, uh, a regular regulation. Periodic. Yeah, some people say there is no regulation. Some people say there is some regulation, like what you're saying today. Yes. But you are using the very symmetrical cubic system. For example, like hexagonal, rhombohedral, or something else. Because yeah. you find such yeah, rules I want to find regulation uh, you know, for the angle boundary, or there's not really meaningful to specify the very small units, like sigma uh, 5 and sigma 30. Right. Like no, it, 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 it's an excellent question, and it comes up every time. So, <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. Um, look, the difference between a boundary which is periodic or aperiodic, there's almost no difference between them. It's just one's easier to talk about than the other. So, if I have a boundary which is not periodic, so if you take a sigma phi boundary and I go and I change the misorientation by one degree, now instead of being sigma five, it's sigma 327,961. So obviously that's not a very physical thing because it changes so much. But now if I go in and look at that boundary, which is 326,961, I know I said the same number twice, um, it just looks like exactly like the sigma phi boundary along distance. And then I have an aperiodic arrangement of something else in there. So I can think it's so it's not periodic. So sigma itself is not a very useful thing. But if I want to understand the basic units of the structure, it's a very good way of doing it. I just have to realize that the whole structure may not really be periodic. So sigma itself is not a good variable. Even though, you know, in these early days, and I, I started by saying if you look in the 1960s and in the 1980s, this, this was a hot argument 
today we don't have to worry about that because we sort of figured out that you know in English called a red herring. You know, it's a it, it's an issue, but it's an issue that does not matter for anything. <laughs> so right, so that's one of the things we have learned in the last twenty years. This is not the TN. Is this a really irrational plan or uh, uh, direction? It doesn't mean anything. Like, like you have a, you have a uh, function like 35, 37, 41. It doesn't mean anything. It's real irrational. So we don't care that kind of orientation or plan. Yeah. yeah so. But, I, but I can always, I mean, so here's a way to think about it. Imagine you have an irrational number. Like, if I take the ratio of two integers, you know, I can always look at I can look at any any number in decimal form, and then can I say, can I express it as a ratio of two integers? If I can express it exactly as the ratio of the two integers, then we say it's rational. That means I can describe by a certain number of units of one and units of the other. But if I want to say something that's irrational, I can get I can approximate that by a rational boundary as close as I want. So any ratio of integers, I can get to be as close as I want to any random decimal you know, with a thousand places. You know, say you wanted to agree within 0 0.1%, 0 0.0001%, 0 0.0001%. I could do any of those. But in fact, you know, it's still the same number, and I just differ by a thousandth of a percent. So it's not exact, but I don't care. I mean, I shouldn't care. So back in the old days, people got hung up on this, and that actually filled the field for 20 years. So you're right, that was a hot topic. It kind of disappeared, but it's, I still hear that question, even in this field, you know, almost every time. It's a good question. I actually mentioned that in a slide before, but it's, it's like one of those things that you can't repeat often enough because it's a misconception because we like to think in terms of periodicity. There's no reason we have to do that. Okay, I have a one question. When I look at the energy profile, the energy assumption on these old pages and Yes. It comes to me that it's just like in a glass. You have the many metastable states that are going down. Yes. So is that possible? That's the next lecture. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I still want to hear the question. Because you know, in this field, uh, now Christian metals, people always talk about uh, stabilized the metal structures. So one theory is that you maybe have green boundaries, which is energetically very stable. Okay. However, there's another competing theory saying that, okay, no, it's not thermodynamic you know, problem, it's actually a dynamic problem. Because in the green boundaries, you move migrate very slowly. So I want to know what your take on this issue. Yeah. Right. So as we'll talk next time, it's possible for grain boundary with a certain macroscopic set of degrees of freedom can have many possible structures. If those energies of those structures are very close together, it still can be described in this way. But if you're smart about it, you have to think of the statistical mechanics. So it's not all this or all that. It's some statistical distribution. And if you then go in and start, stop talking about grain boundary energy, to talk about grain boundary free energy, and put in the configurational entropy having to do with that arrangement, then you'll see that a lot of grain boundary properties will look glassy. Is the grain boundary glass? Absolutely not. Does, are some of the properties very similar to glasses? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and, and by the way, you know, in the very early days of great boundary theory, going back to like the 1920s, there was a picture um, that grain boundaries can be thought of as a crystal region, a crystal region with a layer of liquid or glass in between. So that idea is not a stupid idea. It's a bad description of the structure. It's not a bad description of any properties. Okay. So I'll try to talk about that next time. It's a behavior glass. Not glass. Many, many of the physical properties will behave like glass. You know, we can talk about Kaufman, uh, Kaufman paradoxes and all that kinds of typical glass kinds of things. <laughs>
So yeah, but it you know if you do it right, that should come out. If you don't do it right, then you're just waving your hands. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, in one uh, they call it uh, coherent brain matter. Coherent is the boundary. Yeah. Oh, can we actually uh, the boundary? So it's not the boundary. Um, not quite sure if I understand the question. <laughs> Right. So you, it's it's possible in the brain. So there, there's, there's actually several answers to that. People often call brain boundary uh, a coherent. Uh, talk about a structure is coherent or not in the same sense we talk about as rational or irrational. In which case, that's an argument about nothing. Um, but along the grain boundary, you could have regions which have a very nice order over here. Over here, it can also be a nice order, but a different kind of order. In between, you have some sort of transition. So it looks like a loss of coherence, quote unquote, coherency there. But that, you know, just like when we talk about semiconductors on substrate, thin films on substrates. You know, we talk about coherent interfaces, we talk about incoherent ones, we talk about semi-coherent ones. These, where you have one structure here and one structure here and something in between, that something in between has dislocation character or line that character. And we say that's a region where it has lost coherency. So you can have coherent this way here, coherent that way here, and sort of an quote unquote incoherent region in between. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you mean. The problem is in this field, the terminology is a little bit mixed up. And so it's hard to specify exactly what we're talking about because we don't all have the same language. But it's actually in, in the case of, say, heteroepitaxy. You know, we talk about coherent, semi coherent, and incoherent. A lot of the high angle grade boundaries you can think about as an incoherent boundary, which is regions where there's coherency separated by, by regions which are very close together, yeah. which have dislocation character. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but <laughs> you, you can ask me later. Okay. So next week's topic is green boundary energy and stability and defects. Okay, so this particular big thing is the Thank you. Who are the other kids? From oh, do I get one every, every week? Do I get one every week? Uh, it looks like a diamond. <laughs> oh. Yeah. oh, thank you. Do I get a sapphire next week? Yeah, yeah. I guess we get everybody up here, but then we don't have social distancing. <laughs>